Ridgewood Church is a place where a perfect God meets imperfect people. That means no matter where you're at in life, everyone is welcome here. This is a place where we experience God every time we gather together. A place where we discover community at every stage of life, from kids to adults from all walks of life and in every step of the journey. This is a place where we unpack and engage our God-given purpose. A place where generosity reigns as we live to serve and give back to our generous God, our community, and our world. Because ultimately, we believe that we owe everything to the God who made us and saved us, which is what we're here to do today. So we invite you to join us as we reflect on who God is and respond to all He's done for us, today at Bridgewood. We're going back to the Holy Land in April of 2019. This journey through Israel will be packed full of inspiring days as we experience many of the places where Jesus walked and ministered throughout His life here on earth. If you're interested in joining us, head up to the Upper Level Conference Room right after service today for an informational meeting, where you'll get specific details regarding trip itinerary, cost, application, and date. And in just a couple of weeks, our 21 days of prayer and devotion will kick off on August 5th, as Pastor Kurt launches a new series, Camping Out with God. We'll also be gathering at the Dim Off's home on August 8th, where we'll create space to connect with God and each other in a powerful night of worship and prayer. So start preparing yourself now to join us as we seek God first to create a lasting impact in our lives and our church and our world. Thanks again for joining us this week. For more information about anything you've heard today, stop in the gallery and look for our connection team. Or hop onto the Bridgewood app or website for quick updates on what's going on around here. Good morning, Bridgewood. How you guys doing? Good. I'm also doing... Good, doing well, thanks for asking. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'm honestly really excited to be here today and really humbled um, to have the opportunity to speak to you today. And I feel like the Lord has given me a word that he wants to communicate to me, but also to all of us. And so I've been really leaning in, trying to discern what that is and praying that he would just speak through me today. And I'm just trying to see myself as his representative. Like I'm just here for him to, to flow through me and speak through me to you today, um, and to my own heart, things I need to hear, things that are going to challenge me and shape my thinking and help me align myself more with the, the man, the person that he wants me to be. And so I hope that's where you're at today. Uh, my name is Caleb Weaver, Caleb Channing Weaver. You're like, what's a Channing? What does that even mean? That's my middle name. That's really weird. Um, so you're probably thinking that's either really strange, that's odd, I'm sorry that you have that name, or maybe you're like, oh, that's super unique, that's cool, like Channing Tatum. And if you don't know who Channing Tatum is, you're probably on this side, like, who is that? It's a weird name. But that's my name, <laughs> okay? And I was born with it. Like most people on this planet, it was given to me. I had no choice whatsoever in it. Anybody else can relate to that? Okay, you don't get to choose most of the time unless you legally go about that business. You don't get to choose what your name is. Um, it's actually a little bit of a family name. Okay, my dad's middle name is also Channing. Um, and I think he just felt really alone in the world, I guess. And so when I was born, they're like, yeah, let's stick it on him too. Yeah, um, so thanks. Um, but I've, I've come to terms with it, learn to live with it. It's all good. It could be a lot worse. Um, family names are a thing. Anybody else named after a relative in the house today? A lot of, whoa, a lot more people this service. Yeah, named after family members. Sometimes it turns out awesome. Other times it can turn out kind of off. Sorry. Um, but, but it's a thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a thing we see in our society. It seems like something that has carried, you know, carried out in human society for a millennia, really. And one of my favorite instances of this is George Foreman. You guys know about George Foreman? First service knew all about George Foreman. I was trying to lay it on him like it was a surprise, and I, I don't know what I was thinking. But George Foreman, right, the heavyweight boxing champion, grill master, beloved by all, he has five sons. They're all named George Edward Foreman, all of them. <laughs> so you've got George Edward Foreman Jr., and then you've got George Edward Foreman III, and George Edward Foreman IV, and George Edward V, the sixth, seriously, Five, <laughs> all with the same name. He writes 
On his website, let me pull this up real quick. This is what he says about the reason why he gave his sons the same name. He says, I named all my sons George Edward Foreman so they would always have something in common. Thanks, Dad. I say to them, if one of us goes up, then we all go up together. And if one goes down, then we all go down together. Awesome. Um, and he even named one of his daughters Georgetta. Okay, so that's, to me, that's a little twisted, a little extreme, but I, I think it reveals something really profound. And that's the power in a name, the power in a family name. A family name has the power to define you. It doesn't have to, but it has the power to define you. For example, I was thinking about this. Um, you don't meet many people these days with the name Hitler for good, for good reason. Like they've either died off or they're flying under the radar or they had the wherewithal to change their name to something more acceptable because if, as you can imagine, getting strapped with that name would be kind of hard in our society today. Yikes, if that's your name. Um, so obviously your name can have a dramatic impact on your identity. And numerous studies have shown there's, there's been a lot of research done about the psychology of names and so on and so forth. Um, studies have shown that people's names have been linked to social status, to aspirations, that people appear more likely to choose careers that resemble their own name. So if your last name is Baker, you might have this leaning to want to be, I want to be a baker. Or like I really wanted to be a weaver, like a basket weaver and it didn't work out. That's not true. Um, it wasn't true for me, but anyway. Um, but yeah, that a name can have a positive or negative psychological impact on your life. Um, this truth is apparently universally accepted as several so-called baby names have been banned by governments all over the world. I want to read a few of them for you, and it's going to be awesome. So first of all, let's look to Malaysia. Okay, so in Malaysia, it's illegal to name your baby Smelly Head. Apparently, someone tried that and got rejected, so they banned it officially. You also can't name your baby 007, which I think is kind of tragic, but you can't name your baby 007. If you live in Brazil, you can't name your baby Saddam Hussein. So I think terrorists are kind of off the list um, of acceptable names. Osama bin Laden is off limits in Turkey and Germany, other parts of the world. Makes sense. Um, naming your kid Monkey is against the law in Denmark. Okay. No matter, no matter how much you like Nutella, you can't name your baby Nutella in France. It's against the law. So somebody tried to do that, got shot down. And even though we're in the 21st century now, we're in the technological age, it's still not acceptable to, to use a symbol as a child's name. So there was a couple in China that tried to name their, their child the at sign. Just, I, don't, I don't know how it's pronounced in Chinese, but that was the name. They're like, yeah, we want to name our child that. Um, and the government swiftly said no, they had to go with something else. Um, so can we all just breathe a sigh of relief that we're not dealing with issues like these? I, don't, I would assume, like we all have semi-normal names today, just it could be so much worse. <laughs> so just thank God that your name isn't at. Um, that'd be kind of rough. <laughs> but at the same time, given a healthy set of circumstances, a name can actually take you places in life, right? I'm sure that that's true for all of the George Foremans. I'm sure that's helped open doors for all of those guys. And it can also be a source of pride. Like for me, I remember some of my earliest memories growing up um, were my, my parents dragging my brothers and me every night before we went to bed into a huddle and leading us in what we call the Weaver family chant. Okay? Yeah, that's us. All right, the Weaver family chant, right? So they instilled this in us and every night they'd gather us up and then just indulge me here, take me back, okay? You guys ready? They'd say, give me a W, give me an E, give me an A, give me a V, give me an E, give me an R. What's that spell? Woo, Weaver! And then they would shoo us off to bed and wonder why we're so amped. Like, <laughs> duh. <laughs> like, drink on the world, Weaver, yes! Like, epic, right? So from an early age, I had this connection, this understanding of, of what my name meant and what it represented. I had pride in that. And every time we went to an event, I'm sure some of you guys can relate to this today. Every time we went to someone's house, okay, my dad would be driving, we'd pull into the parking lot or we'd pull into the driveway and he'd stop, get real serious, turn around, look at us in the back seat and go, boys, you'd be on your best behavior because you're representing our family, right? It's a somber, serious moment. We're like, Ugh! right? You're representing your family, so we knew that what we did, the way that we carried ourselves, the way we treated people, all of it mattered. Anybody can relate to that? We knew that. It was instilled in us. 
Now, whether or not that kept us from bouncing off the walls is another story. Don't worry about it. Um, but the point is, is that message stuck with me from an early age. And over the years, despite some of the stupid things I may or may not have done, I never, ever wanted to do anything that would damage or tarnish my family name. I knew that it represented something bigger than myself and sticks with me, even now. But you know what I've realized lately? Is that I, I won't be a weaver forever. And it's not because I'm taking my wife's last name and I'm getting all weird on No, I'm, I'm not doing that, but I'm, my family name for me has an expiration date. And so does yours, honestly. That when I pass from this life to the next, I don't get to take the name Weaver with me. I don't get to take all of my family traditions and the family pride and my heritage and none of it. I don't get to take it with me. I don't get to, to carry that into eternity. And that means whether my story of my family upbringing resonates with you or not, whether you can relate to what I'm talking about or Maybe you had a really rough upbringing and you want nothing to do with your family and your family name that doesn't mean anything to you. No matter where you're at on that spectrum, the truth is, is that we all start from scratch in the only family that lasts forever. We all start from scratch in the only family that lasts forever. When we pass from this life to the next. And right in the beginning of his gospel, John makes this incredible claim about Jesus He says that to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or the will of man, but born of God. And then in 1 John, he says this. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. That's what we are. So while the Weaver family, the Weaver tribe as it exists on earth, won't exist in heaven. God has adopted me, he's adopted all of us into his family that lasts forever. That's what we believe. And he's given us a new name that we identify with. And I know that in theory, this isn't a shock to most of us, probably. We talk and we sing and we declare that we're children of God, that we're sons and daughters of God all the time. We sing, you're a good, good father. Like, he's our father, he's our dad, right? We, it's not something that, is necessarily a secret around here. We, we talk about that all of the time. Yet somehow, at least, I'll speak for myself, my identity seems to be a lot more wrapped up in my life and my family here on earth than it, than it is in my eternal family and destiny. I don't know if anybody else can relate today, but the default orientation of my heart is to be so much more focused and so much more enveloped and wrapped up in in my identity here, and who I am here, and what I represent here, than the things that I'm, I'm supposed to represent and the, the things I'm supposed to be forever. And that can kind of grade against us, especially if we have built this construct of a family here on earth and it's sacred to us. That's great. But we have to recognize there's something greater. There's something beyond that God is doing and wants to do. And he's inviting us into that. And I'm realizing that more and more and it's challenging me to take a closer look at what it means to be a part of his family, to be connected to him. So something that needs to click in us in a more life-defining way is that God, our Father, has a reputation, just like my family has a reputation, right? So understandably, he's fiercely protective. He cares a lot about that. And while he doesn't need anybody, to represent him. We know this. He's perfectly capable of representing himself. He's always desired a people that would represent him to the world. God has always desired a people that would represent him to the world. That was was the whole point of the nation of Israel. God makes a covenant with this nation, with this people, that he would bless them, that he would protect them, that he he would walk with them, he would lead them and guide them if They would stay faithful to him. They would trust in him. If they would follow him, he would have a relationship with him and he would display his glory and his goodness through that group of people to the rest of the world. Obviously, that didn't always turn out so well. (laughs) We see over and over again the people of Israel go back on this covenant, break this covenant, and then they cry out to God and they appeal to him. You see this all throughout Scripture if you check this out. 
Over and over again, they'll say, would you save us? Would you redeem us? Would you rescue us for your name's sake? For your name's sake. They knew better than to appeal for anything else. They knew they didn't deserve it, right? They knew they didn't earn redemption or rescue from God, but they would appeal to him for his name's sake. And time and time and time again, God would answer that. He didn't want his glory to be diminished in the eyes of the world. He didn't want his name to be tarnished. His power to be called into question so he'd forgive, he'd redeem, he'd rescue. 1 Samuel twenty two twelve captures this perfectly. It says, For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. And that was then. But as we just saw in John, we are part of his family now. God has invited us into this. And for those of us that he has called his own, he won't reject us. He won't forsake us. And just like my dad would turn around in the car and look me and my brother square in the eye, serious as could be, and remind us of who we were and what we represented, I think that's what God wants to do for us today. That's what he's been doing for me. And I think that's what he wants to do through me to you today is to remind you of who you really are in him and what you are supposed to represent as part of his family. That's more glorious. It's everlasting beyond anything we can comprehend in this life. It needs to become more and more real to us. So we're going to see today from a passage of Scripture, how we as the family of God have been entrusted to represent Him in the world that we're living in, what it really means for our day to day lives now. My prayer is that we would see ourselves a little more clearly through God's lenses, that we discover more deeply what it means to have been rescued, to have been set free, to have been adopted by God, what that means for us. So, that being said, we're going to camp out in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 today. So if you have a Bible, you can jump there. If you have a phone, you can get there. It's going to be on the screen behind me so you can follow along. And as you're turning there, I'm just going to give you a little bit of context real quick and then we'll dive into it. But if you know anything about the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter to the Corinthians, his life after encountering Jesus was pretty miserable. (laughs) Like he faced constant beatings and imprisonment and he was shipwrecked and you name it, he faced it. He was very well acquainted with suffering. And because He was very well acquainted with suffering. There were people that would watch that and see that. And they started to try to delegitimize his ministry, his message, thinking that like, how could could someone like that, who's suffering and having zero success, right, in the eyes of the world, be associated with this risen, victorious King Jesus, right? So people even within the church were starting to question this guy, like, this guy doesn't seem to be doing so hot, (laughs) So like, should we be listening to what he's saying or should we be you know, doing our own thing and defining our success by the standards of the world? And so Paul is writing again to this dysfunctional, divided church in Corinth, trying to set the record straight, reminding them of the validity of what he's all about, reminding them of, them of his motivation, reminding them where he's coming from so that they can be on the same page. So let's start in verse 14, chapter 5. Read along with me. It says, for, loves, or for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is is here. And all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. A lot packed in there. It's good stuff. But if I had to sum it up 
in one statement, this is what I would say. I would say that we have been reconciled to represent. That's essentially what Paul is saying here, that we have been reconciled to represent. In other words, we have been made right with God. We now have peace with God so that we can make God known. That's the whole point of what he's saying here in this passage. According to him, we are Christ's ambassadors. We're his representatives in the world. And you might be thinking, okay, yeah, I, I, I got that concept. I've, I've heard this before. I, I get that. But what I want to challenge you today with that I feel like God's been challenging me with is that we can't assume that we know what this really looks like in our lives. That we need to check or I guess we need to measure our success in representing him against this text rather than against our own ideas of what that might look like. So yeah, church attendance is great. Do that. Be a part of a life group. That's awesome. Read your Bible. That's great. Okay? Pray. Seek him. But that in and of itself doesn't necessarily quantify our success in terms of representing him to the world around us. We need to take it deeper than that and not just check boxes to make ourselves feel like we're doing what he's called us to do which I'm just being honest, I, I can fall into that trap. And I know that's not what he wants for us. And I, I want to believe the best in all of us today in saying that we want to be his representative. Like if you've encountered Jesus, I, I want to believe that you want to represent him. Are you with me? Kind of have to say yes, <laughs> right here in church. Um, we're supposed to represent him in the world. And if we know him and believe in him, that should be what we want and we can't assume that we know what that means. So let's just remind ourselves today, looking into this passage, digging a little deeper to see where we stack up and what, in what ways we can challenge ourselves to grow beyond where we are today so that we can fully represent him in the way that he's called us to and the way that he desires us to represent him. So I've, I've just broken this down into a few points today, trying to make it as practical and applicable as possible in accordance with this text, with this passage that we just read. So three things to make sure that we're representing Jesus to the world. Three things we can check ourselves against. So the first one that we're going to look at today is that in order to represent Christ, we must first be compelled by love. To represent Christ to the world around us, we first must be compelled by love. Has anyone ever seen the movie Saving Private Ryan before? Anybody? It's okay. You can let me know. All right. Um, it's the kind of movie that sticks with you, right? P powerful, powerful film. Um, just displays so graphically and intensely what war is like. Um, it, it's just intense. <laughs> and if you need a refresher, if you haven't seen it, um, the premise in the movie is it's World War II, right, era. Um, a few days after the invasion of Normandy, D-Day, um, we learn that there are four brothers who are fighting. Three of them killed in action. And there's one that's still alive, we think, but he's missing, right? So that's, that's how the story begins. And so there's this guy named Captain John Miller who's commissioned to gather a group of guys to go find this last surviving brother, Private Ryan. Go find this guy and bring him home. And so he, he rounds up this ragtag group of guys and they go off and they, they, it's an intense journey that they go on, risking life and limb to go find this random stranger that they don't know to bring him back. And all of them are at risk. But that's what they've been commissioned to do. That's what they've been ordered to do. So they go and they do this. And eventually he finds Private Ryan. And at the end of the movie, I'm going to ruin it for you, but I need to for my point. <laughs> um, at the end of the movie, uh, Captain John Miller gets shot and he's mortally wounded and you can you can tell that he's on his last breaths and he pulls private ryan really close pulls him in and he says two last words to him before he dies he says earn this you guys remember that scene anybody he says it's powerful like you can't really forget it if you if you've seen it earn this earn it and then we flash forward to the very end of the movie decades later private ryan is with his family, he's an old man, and he's standing over Captain Miller's grave, wondering to himself, did I live a life that was worthy of the sacrifice you made? Questioning if, if his life was worth what it cost those men. 
to bring him home. He even asks his wife, he says, am I a good man? And you can just tell, like, that stuck with him. That was a moment that defined and shaped the course of his life. It was so personal, it was so real to him that it literally altered the rest of his life. And he tried to live his life in such a way that that he earned the sacrifice. Not that you ever could, you can't earn something like that, but he, he lived his life in such a way that he tried to be worthy of what it cost them. And I think we see this in an even more, more profound way in our text. In verse 14, it says, For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So just picture that scene again, if you can. And imagine it's just you and Jesus. Because when we get a grip on this, it, it really does change everything. When we really do. It's just you and him, he's on the cross, and you realize that he's there because of you and for you. Like you put him there, you put him in that position, and he's there to deliver you, to set you free, to reconcile, to, to make you right with God. If I haven't explain this already, just to be clear, reconciliation, what does that mean? It just means to be made right again, to, to make peace again. And that's what we're seeing here, that that's something that's an act of God for us. And so you see Jesus there, and he's looking into your eyes, and you get that same sense that, man, I, I need to live in such a way that what he's doing for me right now is going to change everything. It's going to change everything. Everything's different now. Because someone paid that kind of price so that I could live, so that I could go home. Changes everything. And now unlike Saving Private Ryan, we can't earn it. Like Jesus never says, I want you to earn this. Because he knows we can't. There's nothing we could do to deserve what he did for us. But we can live in a way that recognizes and honors what he did for us. We can respond to what he did for us. And if I'm really honest today, that, like, that sounds great and that's easy for me to conceptualize here, but it's a lot harder for me to get into my heart and to live as if that's true. So often I forget to look back to Jesus on the cross and let it sink in that it's my, it's my sin. My sin that held him there. I know a sacrifice here, but it doesn't translate to here. And that's where we get into trouble, I think. I think most of us mean well, but the magnitude of Jesus' love is lost on us more often than not. And that's just tragic and sad, but that's just the nature of, of being human. And so because of that, more often than not, when we come to him, we come to him on our terms. We come to him with our agenda, with our stipulations. We tell him how it's going to be, even though we mean well. Or the flip side is, is that we just go about our business, or we go about our day-to-day -day lives as if that never happened, as if he never made that sacrifice, as if that moment never occurred, assuming we have his blessing, which is a really dangerous place to be in, I think. So what that should tell us today is that we need a deeper revelation of his love. If, we're, if we can look at our lives and we can't see a response to the love of God, lived out practically, then, then we know right away, I, I need a deeper revelation of God's love for me because I don't really like, I don't really, I don't really care. That really hurts to say, but man, I'll be honest, it's not like I actually believe that or think that, but my life looks like that. I don't live as if he, he died and rose again for me. I don't live that way all the time. That's convicting, that's challenging to me. And it, this exposes the fact that, man, maybe I'm not representing him like I'm supposed to be. And maybe that's true for you too. So the first step in representing Jesus is getting a grasp on his love and setting our agenda aside so that we can take hold of his. He died so that we wouldn't live for our sake, but that we would live for his. So we need to get a grip on that. If we hope to represent him to the world around us. Number two, if we want to represent Christ, we must be concentrated on eternity. 
If we want to represent Christ, we must be concentrated on eternity. Kind of touched on that already with the family name, right? Um, a few months before Michaela and I got married, I uh, woke up one morning to the uh, startling reality that I had to move out of my house like that day. Um, there was a little bit of a crisis situation and all of a sudden I needed to find a new place to live or I was going to be homeless and I wasn't cool with that. So um, I was scrambling, stressed, trying to figure out what to do because we were just, like I said, a few months away from getting married. We were you know, getting ready to move into our new house together, getting it set up. She, she had her place, I had mine, but now all of a sudden I'm trying to figure out what to do. And Fortunately, there was a family in the church, thank God for the church, when they rise up and act like the church, it's great. Um, they opened up a room in their home for me to stay and they're like, hey, you can stay with us until the wedding. I'm like, awesome, thank you. So I grab all my stuff, I shuttle it over to the new place and um, I moved in, but I didn't really move in, if you know what I mean? Like I, technically my bed was in there and I had a few shirts hanging in the closet maybe um, but other than that, I was just kind of living out of boxes and suitcases. Um, and I thought to myself, you know, I can, I can handle this for a while because I'm going to be moving again in like a few months. So what's the point? And I'm never here. So what's the point, right? Uh, it didn't occur to me to try to, to set up shop there and to completely establish my home in that little tiny room and live as if I was going to be there long term. That would that would have been kind of ridiculous. And I think we can all agree Yet, I feel like that's kind of the way that we treat our lives here. If you stop and think about it. That our lives here on earth in light of eternity, we, we, we treat this transitional home that we're in, we're just passing through, right? For a quick season, but we treat it and we live as if this is our permanent residence. With no foresight, with no concept of the future that's to come. And that could come in, a, in the blink of an eye for us, really. Nothing is guaranteed, nothing is promised, other than we are going to live forever, <laughs> right? That's what we believe here. And that's the way that we tend to live. And even worse than stuff, and the way that we view that, we tend to view ourselves and each other through this powerfully deceptive lens, too, that this is all there is in life. What you can see, what you can feel, what you can touch, what you can wrap your arms around. That's it. Not realizing that everything that we've worked here for, the legacy we're building, if it's not eternal, it's not coming with us. And that's not to negate anything that we're doing in this world. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we shouldn't invest in this world, that we shouldn't contribute to this world. But we need to just remind ourselves and not get caught up in this deception that what we're doing, what we're putting our hands to, what we're building, what we're trying to accomplish, what we're striving for in the here and now, we don't get to take that with us. Looking at verse 16 again, Paul writes this. He says, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone the new is here. So when we're concentrated on eternity, we begin to value things differently. You tracking with that? When we're concentrated on eternity, when we're fixated on the reality of eternity, the things we value just start to shift and change. And it just becomes so obvious right away when you start to think about it. You start to put things in perspective in the light of that. And not only, not only things, but people. Because we realize that really people are the only thing that lasts forever, that pass from this life to the next. And by definition, a new creation, as Paul writes, is a redeemed, reconciled soul who lives for Christ by living for others. So with eternal lenses, when you look at another human being, you see past the facade of the world, to see someone who will live forever with God or apart from from him. Like that is the reality that you start to see the world through and that automatically brings a burden. It should. And we start to become burdened for the world the way that, the way that our God is. He's burdened for the world for a reason because he recognizes he lives in eternity. He understands the stakes. And so often we're so, I don't, again, I'll speak, I'm going to be speaking for myself over and over again because this is so much for me. 
over and over again, I, I get so distracted and so locked into what I'm doing today, where I'm going to go for lunch. Relax. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come, okay? I get caught up in all of these things that get my mind and my focus off of what's truly, what's truly valuable in the light of eternity. And I realize when this, isn't, when this is happening in my own life because I, I start to grow indifferent towards people. Like I start to care less and less about my interactions with people. It starts to become devalued to me. And just like we sang this morning though, we need to sing this, to teach my heart with all your wisdom to live for heaven. We need to make it our prayer that we would live in the light of eternity, that we would live out our, we would live out our lives out of our metaphorical boxes and suitcases, not getting too comfortable in this world. Because it's a deception. Trying to set up a life of comfort and contentment and happiness in the here and now and thinking that's going to solve everything is just such a deception that we need to break free from. Because we can only hope to represent Christ so long as we're concentrated on eternity. You get that? You have to be focused on eternity. That's hard, man. That's hard. But it's what he's calling us to. And lastly, number three, we must be committed to his message. If we want to represent Christ, we must be committed to his message. I love Spider-Man. I don't know if there are any superhero fans in the house. Spider-Man was my, my boy. Okay, I always wanted to be like him. And I resonated with him because he's this nerdy, regular kid, right? Peter Parker from Queens. And he gets bit by a radioactive spider and gets superhuman power. So I can't relate to that. But, um, but I always connected with him and I always you know, dreamed of what it would be like to like swing through skyscrapers or be able to scale buildings with just my hands and feet or had to have like a spidey sense, whatever that means. I wanted that and I actually kind of got to live out that dream um, in my teenage years. I convinced this five-year-old that I, I was Spider-Man. Um, I w- <laughs> it was awesome. Um, I would place my hand like this on a table and because he was five, he couldn't do anything about it. But I said, try to move my hand. I, it's my sticky spider fingers, you can't do it. So he'd be like, uh, uh, trying to move him. like, see, I'm Spider-Man. Shh, don't tell anybody. Keep this under wraps. You got to conceal my identity. I got you. I'm your friendly, I'm your na- friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. I got your back. Just shh, don't say anything. And I had him convinced for years. So later he told me that he'd never believe me, but whatever. Um, <laughs> don't care. It's all beside the point anyway. <laughs> the point is, one of the most infamous lines from the spider universe um, is, a, is a quote from Peter Parker's Uncle Ben. And he says this to him. He says, with great power comes great responsibility. Have you guys heard this before? With great power comes great responsibility. And I couldn't help but get this drilled into my brain as I was reading this passage. Except for one word that changed just a little bit. And for me, what I think this passage is communicating is that with great reconciliation comes great responsibility. With great reconciliation comes great responsibility. Meaning, when you have been reconciled, like we all have here in this room today, there's a, there's a, res, there's a responsibility that's attached to that. There's something that comes along with that. We see this in verse 18. I'll read it again. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. I love how it's summed up in Ephesians 2 where Paul says this about Jesus' message of reconciliation. He says, He came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to you who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And what Paul is saying to the Corinthians is that we have been entrusted with that same message, that we have peace with God, we've been reconciled through Jesus' sacrifice, through which we've been made family with him now. That's the message. And the hard, honest truth, yet again, for me and I think for all of us, 
is that so many of us want the benefits and the blessings of being a part of God's family, but we don't want the responsibility. We want to be a part of God's family. We want to say, yeah, I'm a child of God. He's my good, good father. Yes. But when it comes to what that means for our lives, the implications it has for us, the responsibility that's attached to that, we don't, want, we don't really want anything to do with that. Like, we'll, we'll pass on that. Thanks for what you did for me, Jesus. I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm not really about that. It's not really my gift. It's not really my thing. Um, I'm going to stick with what I'm, good, what I'm good with, what I'm comfortable with, what makes sense to me, what feels good to me. But, but thanks. You see how that doesn't really work in light of everything that we're seeing in this passage? That doesn't, really, that doesn't really work. We can't have it both ways. When we recognize the kind of love that Jesus had for us, just imagine, again, going back to saving Private Ryan. Imagine Private Ryan being like, okay, thanks, man. I'm going to go do my thing now. Appreciate it. Like that, that would be horrible. And yet, we're, we're pretty comfortable with doing that. Aren't we? Ugh. That's challenging to me too today. But if we truly understand the way Jesus loved us in bearing the weight of our sin and the wrath of God so that we could be clean, if we truly have a grasp on how temporary and fading this life is and how long eternity will be and that God has given us this message to share with those he longs to make peace with, how can we shy away from the responsibility that comes along with it? How dare we do that, honestly? We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If you don't remember anything else, that I say today, I want you to remember this because I feel like this just really summarizes and captures everything that we've been looking at. It's that the God of the universe wants to make peace with the world through us. If we've received that for ourselves, we're happy with Jesus coming and laying his life on the line so that we can be at peace with him then we need to see that, no, he, his work isn't finished yet. And we're here for a purpose and for a reason. And that's to represent him, to proclaim that message that he's entrusted to us, to the world that's still far from him, to the world that's still lost, to the world that still hasn't been reconciled to him. That's not just an option that he gives us. That's a responsibility that we owe him as his family. That's a reputation that he wants to, to protect. That we would be people, that his people would be willing and able to represent him to the world. I think we can let that sink in a little. I know it's, it weighs on me because there are ramifications that come along with that. It means I have to change. I have to step outside my comfort zone. But if Jesus was willing to step outside of his comfort zone, if he was willing to step off of a throne in heaven for junk like you and me, then how can I say no to, stay, to stepping outside my comfort zone, to making myself available to him, to be used by him so that he can flow through me and do what he wants to do in the world around me? So with every head bowed and eye closed this morning, I think there are a few ways we can respond to all this. Maybe you're listening to all this, you're hearing about reconciliation, about peace with God, and that's not something that you have ever experienced fully. You've never come face to face with Jesus on the cross and realized that what he did that day was for you and that your sins held him there and you've never made things right with him. Paul goes on to say in chapter six, he says, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. We don't put a stumbling block in your way. Be reconciled to God. He, he says, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. It says, if Jesus is coming to you and saying, please, come home, please. I, I've done everything. I've given my life. I've laid everything down to make peace with you. Will you not come? Will you not come home with me? I'm adopting you into my family. 
I'm washing you clean of every wrong thing you've ever done. I paid for that. Will you not come home? So I want to invite you today, if that's you, man, today's the day to get started on this journey of walking with Jesus, of being reconciled, of being free, of being at peace with him who gave his life to be at peace with you. So if that's you today, would you just lift your hand so I can pray for you? If you want to be reconciled to God, never been reconciled to him, don't have a relationship with him. Can I, just raise your hand and hold it up for a second. Anybody today? Can I see that hand? Thank you. We have ushers that are going to bring a next steps kit to you. If you raise your hand, just keep your hand up. This is for you to start your journey, okay? You can read his word. You can learn about his character. You can learn about what it means to be a part of his family and walk on this journey with him. It's incredible. It's amazing. It's life-altering. It's exciting. And he's done all the work. He's done what it, what it took to make peace with you. And it's done. If you confess your sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's the beautiful truth. And I think for the rest of us, we can respond. I, here's how I'm responding today. And maybe you want to join me. As I feel compelled, I feel convicted to rededicate my life today to leaning into the love of God a little bit more than I have of preaching the gospel to myself over and over again until it gets ingrained in my brain what Jesus did for me so that it has a, a legitimate effect on my life to the point where it merits a response from my life, to the point where I'm not comfortable just sticking back anymore on the sidelines, doing what I want to do, living for myself, but it moves me and motivates me beyond. I want to challenge myself, rededicate myself to think more and more about eternity to think about heaven, to think about where I'm going to spend the entirety of my existence when I pass from this life to the next and allow that to shape my identity, the way that I see people, the way that I see stuff, the way that I prioritize things in my life. And then I'm going to commit myself, commit myself to his message, recognizing that he's done all this for me, not so that I could get my own word out there, but so that he could, he could appeal to the world around me, through me, with the same message of hope and love and life, reconciliation, peace in him. So if that's you today, would you just stand? If you want to commit yourself today to representing him like never before, this resonates with you. You want to take that step forward. You want to take that commitment. I just invite you now to stand to your feet in this moment so that we can respond. Yeah, amen. 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 We're going to sing this song again. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world, take this life and breathe on this life that's yours. There's no greater call than giving you my all, so I lay it all down for you. So if that's you today, let's declare this together. Let's lift our voices to him and sing this over our lives with all of our hearts and lean into who he's called us to be to represent him and have it all. I want to encourage you today as you leave because a lot of the things we've been looking at and talking about can, can be overwhelming. At least they can be to me. I feel like a burden, like a weight. Like how am I supposed to, to do this? How am I supposed to represent Jesus? Like who am I that I, I could do something like that? The really cool thing about all of this is is that we don't have to represent ourselves. We don't have to come up with something to, to say. We don't have to, to preach a message. We don't have to have an agenda. It says that God wants to make his appeal through us. His appeal. His agenda. So what he's looking for is not for you to, to become some scholar, right? That would be cool. What he's looking for is someone who's open, 
someone who's willing, someone who's daring enough to take a step forward into being who he's called them to be, someone who's willing to represent him. And then he'll do the work. He'll do the rest as you open yourself up to that. He'll, he'll teach you. He'll show you what that means, what that looks like. And we can, we can learn what that looks like together. That's why, we, that's why we come together, to encourage each other, and to spur one another on in these things, to push each other to be more and more like the people that he's called us and designed us to be. So don't be discouraged. Don't be burdened. Don't be overwhelmed by this. Be excited. If you truly mean to follow through with representing him, he, he'll do the work. He'll show you. He'll start using you. I've experienced this. It's amazing. You step out in faith. He meets you there. So be excited about it. Take that step of faith. Don't be afraid. He's with you. He's going to walk with you. He's going to do incredible things through you to reach the world around, like, around you like you could never possibly even imagine. Can't wait to see that as we commit ourselves to that. I want to make this statement one more time, but this time I want us to say this together and over our own lives, okay? So the last statement that we just shared, let's declare this over ourselves together and take hold of everything that it means for us. Okay, here we go. The God of the universe wants to make peace with the world through me. One more time. The God of the universe wants to make peace with the world through me. It's so good. Own that. Own that today. Let me pray. God, you're an incredible, amazing, awesome God. And you're an amazing father. We're humbled that you have entrusted this message of reconciliation, this message of peace to us. And Lord, we don't want to receive that in vain. God, we want to be useful. We want to represent you right. We want to follow you in everything that implies. So God, would you help us? Would you show us what it means, what it looks like to represent you? Would you show us what it means to be your ambassadors in your word? Would you control us? Would you compel us with your love? Would you motivate us and, and give us a passion and a burden to see people the way that you do, supernaturally, like we never have before? God, that's our prayer. That's our desire. That's our hunger today. So would you, would you grant us that desire as we seek you for that? And would you make us a people, make Bridgewood Church a place that represents you truly to the world around us for your glory and for their joy for their salvation for their peace in jesus name amen 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 yeah he's good he's gonna do it he's gonna do it so go live for jesus go live for him we'll see you next week love you bridgewood We're going back to the Holy Land in April of 2019. This journey through Israel will be packed full of inspiring days as we experience many of the places where Jesus walked and ministered throughout his life here on earth. If you're interested in joining us, head up to the upper level conference room right after service today for an informational meeting where you'll get specific details regarding trip itinerary, cost, application, and date. And in just a couple of weeks, our 21 days of prayer and devotion will kick off on August 5th as Pastor Kurt launches a new series, Camping Out with God. We'll also be gathering at the Dim Offs home on August 8th, where we'll create space to connect with God and each other in a powerful night of worship and prayer. So start preparing yourself now to join us as we seek God first to create a lasting impact in our lives and our church and our world. Thanks again for joining us this week. For more information about anything you've heard today, stop in the gallery and look for our connection team. Or hop onto the Bridgewood app or website for quick updates on what's going on around here.